Well, thank you for awarding us the wild card. It's a really nice uh, to take it opportunity. Well, maybe you have seen Elon Musk this summer on stage explaining what he wanted to do with his company Neuralink and how he wants to help paraplegic people communicate again. Maybe you have heard renowned scientists from big universities when they presented their research results, how they were going to help locked in patients. Maybe you even have heard me say that I would do so. The problem now is that we all use this very small group of people um, as a justification for our cool work. And I don't think it's actually helping these locked in patients, neither do I think it's helping the brain computer interface industry. So I'm Ivo de la Reef Box from MindEffect. We have actually helped a locked in patient. We were now trying to open up these new dimensions of interactions for a much larger audience. So what we see is that there are all these scientists working on the same use case on their, in their own silo, and we really need to add more creativity and skills from other parts of the world, other people, uh, to this domain. So what we have done is we have helped this person. We're really, really proud that he can now communicate over two hours a day with his wife. But we have tried to take apart our solution so that we can offer that to anyone as a development kit. And now we'll show you how that would work. And uh, Raphael has on his head an EEG headset, the standard EEG material. He has an iPad in his hand. And on the iPad, we have cases, which you cannot see, are blinking really fast. And every case has its own blinking pattern, just like a Morse code. And when it, that, that code is being blinking, his eyes see it, th then the visual cortex reflects to that. We can measure it to the EEG, and then our algorithms deduct to which case you're looking. So we'll now end the demo uh, for the cameras. Uh, Raphael is showing how he can move this robot with his brain. And if one of the judges doesn't believe it, he can say whether it has to go straight or turn right or left. <laughs> Make him spin in circles. <laughs> Well, it's a very limited spin. So but, uh, the iPads he will go on and... Uh, so the I, sorry, he's based off of his blinking patterns, then the, that gets translated to the robot? Yeah, so what happens, the, the applications on the iPad, there the blinking patterns are presented to the task that you want, so the right or the left. Okay. Yeah. So uh, every block has its own blinking pattern, like it would have its own Morse code. Mm -hmm. His eyes look at the one that he wants to action, the EEG measures the response mm. that the visual cortex has and then set back which code he has seen and then the iPad actually sends the message to the Lego robot. Okay? Um, so, uh, our IP on this, uh, we have two patents, one on the principle of having these blinking patterns and get it out of uh, the brain with the algorithms and then the second one is to use it for a brain-computer interface. Uh, the great thing about this way of working is that you have like an endless amount of cases you can put on the interface so it's very simple to make complex interfaces in the end for all the same solution. Uh, and it really needs no training. So within a minute, you look at the first few blinking patterns and the system is trained. And in the case of this locked-in person, every day he does his calibration at first, but then he can talk with his wife. So if we can move back to the slides, please. The, the world of BCI really is mostly still an academic play. And where it is commercial, it's really for uh, neuroprosthetics. Uh, a market, an what analysts say, will grow to 1.8 billion in 2023. But the play that we are doing here really is about the chance that brain-computer interfaces might be one of the dominant paradigms to communicate to computers in the future for at least simple tasks. So I won't size that market for you here today. Uh, if anyone invested in multi-touch screens before the iPhone, I'd be happy to know how they size the market to do their work. Um, but let's see. So on the uh, competitive field, uh, the biggest competition actually comes from current technology. We're really good in using a button, a touch screen, voice, or even eye tracking to command the computer. Uh, we'll really have to prove uh, that there are other things for which a BCI is more suited than that. So we were founded two years ago as a university spin-out. 
um, really with the first aim to help uh, these patients. Uh, we raised one million, uh, redid all the academic work, did the coding engineering, uh, went to 10 patients in hospital, 30 patients at home, and now have this one user using it on a daily basis. And next month at CES in Las Vegas, we will launch our development kit. So we are a small team, mostly of uh, very renowned technicians. Peter De a professor of AI at the Nijmegen University in uh, Holland, has been working on this for years with his collaborator, Jason Farquhar, who is now full-time on our team and leads these young, talented people in AI. And I myself have been successful with a smart thermostat started before and will not try to repeat that effort. So thank you very much. And if you always have wanted to have a BCI at home yourself or within your company trial, you could do next January, you can uh, buy it. Uh, so please watch us and uh, see the announcements about the launch at CES. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Judges. So is the big challenge, the, 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 the challenge here is that uh, it's for people who are disabled normally, right? Meaning they would use this instead of maybe use, using this to move around the house or something like that, right? Yeah, so the, the first audience that we catered to were these lock-in people. So they can hear, they can smell, they can see, but mm -hmm. they have no way to command any muscles anymore. Yeah. So moving around the home mood is technically feasible when you command a robot, but communication is the first thing we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one patient that we have been helping, uh, he wanted to be able to control his TV because if he doesn't like the channel anymore, and his wife is not there, he wants to change that. Uh, so like moving a robot, we can also send a signal to a TV. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, if this is for people who, who can't move generally, but it's requiring people to move their eyes around the screen, right, to look at the specific yeah. trigger, why couldn't you use retina or eye tracking for that? Yeah, so uh, most people, fortunately, who are locked in or almost locked in, have solutions right now. Uh, so we launched this startup on this like holy grail of scientists in BCI space, like Elon Musk as well, he also said the same use case, uh, hoping that we could help these people, uh, engineer the technology up to a level that you could bring it to them, and then move to other use cases. Uh, and we thought there would be some business. We have to be very honest in the fact that for us it's unfortunate, but for them, eye tracking works pretty well. So, but in this case, this Belgian patient, it, it didn't. So he has an Asian background, he has dark eyes, smaller, so their eye tracking has issues. Eye tracking has issues with sunlight, so they often cannot go out. Um, but I do acknowledge that there is very good technology for these people already. And, uh, sorry, you said you already ran a pilot. Did I see that on there, or are you about yeah. to run a pilot? No, no, we have run a pilot with, uh, so first it was a hospital setup with 10 ALS patients and 10 healthy people to compare if it would work for this uh, group of patients, it did. And then we have been to 30 people at their home uh, to see it in the context of their residential environment, how they would live and how it would work. Do you need to go through CE, Mark? Sorry? Do you need to go through like clinical trials and do CE? No, so actually because we have always positioned this as a well. device that could be used for gaming as well as for the medical purpose, uh, one of the reasons obviously is that there is a larger market in more gaming kind of applications. The other is that then it's a generic device and you don't need the medical of approvals from CE or FDA. And what about um, getting it covered by insurance, or how do, how, is it, how do people pay for it? So I'm not sure about all the regions in the world, but at least uh, in the part that I'm fortunate to live in, uh, assistive technology is already insured. Yeah, so if you can get an eye tracker for your ailment, you could also get this. Uh, actually, the insurance companies are really supportive in these kind of efforts because they know the numbers are low and the spin-off of supporting an effort of helping someone is pretty high. So mm -hmm. it's not going to be a major burden for them and it is already a prescribed thing. Mm. So I have a lot of sympathy for obviously trying to run a live demo and then not having it work 100%. Um, I think you, you mentioned just now that there were latency issues just now that, that prevented the robot from going in a circle. Um, how do you fix that? Like what, what, what's the, what are the challenges between getting it to be almost seamless yeah. and where we are now. So quite honestly, I don't know uh, what the issue was. It could be multiple things. It sure. could be the cameras, the lights, the RF signals. Um, 
so obviously this, the state where we're at, there are a lot of challenges uh, in the engineering part. Uh, we have mostly been focusing on the robustness of getting the brain signals out. Uh, and then we have to make it useful for all kinds of people. And the thing is that in history, old BCR work says like it works on 70% of the people. Now, I don't think there's any scientific evidence of why that would be 70%. The thing is there are challenges on the physical part of how the skull works, etc. So that's our major thing first. Kay. And then all the engineering part on getting a signal from a iPad to a robot on the stage with RF signals. I mean, I consider that solved in general, right. even if for us on the demo side, uh, it may still be a challenge every time we'll come up uh, and are happy to do that uh, just like that with a BCI on stage. No, I mean, I, I imagine if I were a patient, God forbid, you know, with, with that sort of condition, just being able to move it an inch would, would you know, make me really happy. So kudos, yeah. well done. And so uh, we have an issue like this, uh, the most important application actually for these locked-in patients would be an alarm button because they can have problems with swallowing, which can be lethal. Uh, and then these alarm buttons are get all these constructions that they build around people for any muscle that they can still move. Um, and we could do that, but then there's so many like ethical and legal issues around an alarm button that we just said it's messaging. You, you can have a preset message to your wife or your nurse or if you look at it, but it's a messaging system. It doesn't always work. It's uh, cool. It will still be a step to have, for sure, 100% reliance uh, on getting these brain signals correct. Yeah. All right, we are pretty much out of time. So give it up for Mind Effect. Thank you. And that concludes.